My baby dolls, we are back. Another special episode of Genesis. As most of you know, I haven't been doing the show. Uh, There's something because I got two little monkeys that I call my twin boys running around, going to camp, swimming in lakes, you know, all the good things. And uh, most of the um, shows that are going to be coming up is this uh, fall. Today we have a recurring guest in Hank Thomas, who is the grandson of probably the best pitcher, uh, arguably the best pitcher that's uh, ever played uh, in professional ball, Walter Johnson, a.k.a. the big train. And, you know, when we had Hank on earlier in the year, I think April or May, when I posted it, he got a lot of hits on his uh, Facebook page. I was very surprised that a lot of these folks didn't even know that uh, Hank was the grandson of – the legendary Walter Johnson. Like, hey, congratulations. And I'm reading. I'm like, the book was put out 22 years ago, folks. Hey, this is good. It's the second coming. But you know something? <laughs> but you know, yeah, I, yeah it just, it, you know something? It, it, was, it was good to see because I know by reading up on it, you know, Hank didn't do this for uh, profit. He did it so that, uh, you know, people could learn. And uh, my shows take into consideration uh, learning, and of course, the dead ball is one of those areas uh, which has piqued my interest uh, within the last uh, few years. And uh, if you would have uh, told me the five pitchers uh, I would have had uh, before I learned about uh, Walter Johnson and uh, others of the dead ball eras, I would have said Clemens, uh, you know, uh, maybe Bob Feller, uh, Whitey Ford, Sandy Koufax. Uh, Randy Johnson, Greg Maddox, um, maybe Catfish Hunter. Uh, but then when I read about Walter Johnson uh, through, uh, you know, Mr. Thomas's uh, heavily researched book on his grandfather, Walter Johnson, Baseball's Big Train, um, it made me uh, rethink that and um, do further research on um, Walter Johnson besides Mr. Thomas's book, which I have and which we're going to get in today because last time we went an hour and a half today. We're only going to go until 2, which is about 15 minutes from now, and we're going to have Hank on again in the uh, fall edition. But, um, you know, what I want to get out today is the man himself, uh, you know, and little things that maybe all of us don't know about uh, Walter Johnson uh, and, and why he was so overlooked uh, before and how this book and how a new generation, especially with the recreation of the uh, Washington Nationals, um, are giving Walter Johnson his due. Now, if you go back 100 years, I mean, you go back to 1917, that was half uh, his career was over. He began in 1907. He finished his career in 1927. So 100 years ago at this time, You know, Walter Johnson was half career, and by that time, he already established himself as the premier pitching, uh, you know, for the American League, uh, for the Washington Senators for that matter, but he didn't play on good teams. And, you know, when you look at his statistics, although they're eye-popping, I always say, you know, if Walter Johnson played for the New York Yankees or the Boston Red Sox or the Detroit Tigers with Ty Cobb, it might have been a little bit different in the statistics for the win columns, but for God's sakes, folks, 110 shutouts, you know, all these strikeouts, all these numbers, he did it with the subpar uh, Senators team until uh, the dead ball era passed into the live ball era, and we're going to get into that with Hank Thomas, uh, regarding, you know, the differences, what Johnson did differently, or how he, you know, uh, again, the balls were different, you, you know. Before 1920, you weren't allowed to throw. You were allowed to throw a spitball. Now you had to be grandfathered in. Why did Walter Johnson use clean balls when he could have had the advantage of using balls that look like a head of cabbage after nine innings of play? So we're going to get into all this stuff. Of course, you are listening to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network with the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho. It's always an honor to be on his network. Where the network is growing. We have Nancy. Finley on, who was the niece of Charlie Finley. She does Oakland A's baseball with Ralph. Um, you know, we have Bill Cashadis coming in the fall on Philadelphia baseball. Eldon Ham, who is a huge sports lawyer and sports personality on talk radio in Chicago, coming in in the fall to do Chicago White Sox, Chicago Cubs uh, baseball. And of course, 
My show, Genesis, will be returning. This is a special episode. And when we talk about Walter Johnson, <laughs> can't get any more special than that. Without any further ado, welcome to the show, Hank. Oh, thanks, Ian. Glad to be here. Glad to be back. Well, Oh, it, it, you know, it's it's the, you know it struck me. It really struck me the first time that we spoke that people would love the uh, interview as much as they did, and and the praises you got for it. I, I mean, oh. I, you know, I I was I was just like, oh my God, these guys don't these folks don't know. <laughs> well, a lot of people do, you know. Uh, uh, I hope uh, you know my book has increased the awareness. Uh, as you said, that's how how you came to appreciate the Walter Johnson story. But uh, I think you uh, hit the nail on the head when uh, you said that if he had been with a with a more prominent uh, club back in his time, especially the Yankees, but also the Red Sox were really good back then and. Got into the World Series. He didn't get into a World Series until his 18th season, and that's where um, even today. I mean, that's where you get uh, real crossover um, prominence uh, by players is when they appear. Yeah, if they're an All Star, okay. A lot of people watch the All Star game, but people are really tuning into the World Series. And if you get if you get to the World Series, then people will know about you. But you can be really great. And labor, uh, you know, unsung for a uh, down market team for a long time. And people, um, you know, other than seeing your name in the columns uh, for with statistics, uh, really don't know much about you and aren't paying much attention. And that's that's the story of, of Walter Johnson's career. I don't want to overstate it. In his time... Uh, he was regarded, uh, once he started having those fabulous seasons in 1912-13, I mean, he was 36-7 and seven in 1913, for God's sakes, uh, his sixth season. And, you know, at that point, uh, he was generally regarded as the greatest pitcher that had come along, uh, kind of taken over the place that Cy Young at first had held and then Christy Matheson. Well, then it was... Walter Johnson, and he was—he would routinely be called the king of the pitchers, and people would say, you know, they were writing columns to baseball writers about how, well, you know, I think Walter Johnson's the best pitcher, maybe that's ever lived and stuff, and and uh, even, uh, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, I'd read the books, uh, big time baseball, it, you know, called him, they had him as the best pitcher of all time, and other books, uh, and then The Glory of Their Times came out in 1966, and you had interviews with the uh, old-time players, and boy, they made it clear who they thought, um, and it was almost unanimous among them. The guys that played against him, uh, that uh, he was the best that they ever saw. So I don't want to overstate the case, but gosh, if he'd been uh, if he'd been with the Yankees. Uh, uh, you know, he'd have a stature approaching something uh, like that of Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle or Joe DiMaggio or Lou Gehrig, those guys. Uh, he would be the pitcher in that group uh, for sure. But he was in Washington, and they never had any money. And uh, there was three seasons in a row, three of his peak seasons, where the Senators didn't have a single 300 hitter for uh, years. And... Um, so, uh, but then in the, you know, as you mentioned, in the 20s, uh, uh, the Senators not only got into uh, one World Series, but two in a row, and all of a sudden, boy, that's when he, uh, that's when the uh, the scrapbooks really started filling up that my grandmother kept, really started filling up with articles, and uh, now he's, yeah, now he's getting his due, um, but uh, time passes, and um you know, again, uh, if he'd been with a different club, uh, his legacy would have been a little more prominent. But hopefully my book did a little bit. Uh, and you're helping. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to help you every way. I'm, 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 I'm going to even hedge on this because you bring up an interesting point I was going to bring up later. But, like, you know, like everyone knows, my shows are not scripted. I go with the flow. October 10th, 1924. The big train, he lost two games already to the New York Giants, and he's on one-day rest, and this is a 3-3 tie. 
And what does Bucky Harris do in the later innings? He's bringing in Walter Johnson, who, who you wrote, really didn't like the relief pitching role. Well, you know, um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Well, he he kind of got abused by some of the managers he played for. I mean, they he he had such durability. I mean, he did things that. Uh, you can't even, uh, you know, he had that easy sidearm motion, and it just didn't take anything out of him to pitch a ball game, it seems. And uh, he pitched an 18-inning shutout once. Uh, he won one to nothing. That's the longest shutout. I mean, that's two games, 18 innings. He pitched three shutouts in four days. That's the one that people just can't even, I mean, they can't even, Get their heads around, you know. It's a, but he that, he did it. He pitched. That that was a small year, I think. That it was, was. nineteen eight. You know, he's twenty years old, big strong kid. You know, off the farm, and you know he uh, had that easy motion that you can get on YouTube and see how he threw. He just had this. Uh, he whipped the ball, as people said, uh, and you can see that it's just not putting a lot of strain on his arm. But he shut out the. Before they were the Yankees, they're called the Highlanders. This is 198. And he shut them out on a Friday with six hits. He pitched Saturday. You know, the Washington pitching staff was shot, and the manager said, well, how do you feel, Walter? He said, oh, I feel pretty good after pitching a full game the day before. So he pitched him. He, he shoot through a four-hit shutout. And uh, they didn't play on um, Saturdays back then. Monday was a Labor Day. It was a holiday, and they had a doubleheader. And the manager, you know, and now Walters had a day rest after pitching two days in a row, and the manager says, how do you feel? And Walters said, well, let me go out and warm up and see. And he said, yeah, I, I think I can do it. I feel okay. So he pitches his third game in four days, and he got better. He had six hits, four hits, and then that third game he pitched a two-hit shutout. And then he went and hid in the locker room, hiding from the manager because he was afraid. He thought the manager would ask him to pitch the second game of the double. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he went and hid. That's a true story. He went and hid in the locker room. and uh, But people don't believe that. So so these managers, you know, they got, they got Walter Johnson. So they wouldn't hesitate in between the games of his own where he's, you know, he won 417 games. As you mentioned, he pitched 110 shutouts. So he's just doing fine as a starting pitcher. He completed 532 of the 666 games that he started. He finished. That's five out of six. So he would he would pitch a complete game virtually every time. But then in between those, the managers wouldn't hesitate to bring him in in a close game, in relief to finish it. You know, pitch the, you know, eighth inning, ninth inning, sometimes the seventh, eighth, and ninth. He pitched 11 and two-thirds innings in relief one time. The game just kept going on and on, and he ended up uh, with 15 strikeouts in that game. That was just a relief appearance. That's in between his starts. So, I don't know. I I can't remember that I wrote, you know, whether he had whether he liked or disliked relief pitching. Um, if you tell me that in my book it says that he didn't like it, I believe you. But, yeah, uh, if you wrote, you wrote. It's been a long time since I've read my book, and uh, certainly even longer since I wrote it. But uh, you know, there was this was borderline abuse on the part of his manager. And you, and but they had Walter Johnson, you know. So uh, and and the batters. I know. I I do remember that I wrote um, where uh, the hitters that faced him said uh, they wrote about or talked about what a discouraging sight it was to see Walter Johnson get up from the dugout and go to the bullpen to warm up. And it's almost like they they said, well, you know, oh my gosh. I mean, we 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 virtually gave up. It's like, okay, our reward for knocking the pitcher out, the starting pitcher out of the game, was that now we've got to face Walter Johnson. <laughs> they said it was, it was just very discouraging and very depressing. And he did very well in relief, of course, like he did 
you know, in his starting appearances. But, um, gosh, and, and then, he, I mean, he played 15 games in the outfield for the Senators. He pinch hit 110 times. He was a good hitter, too. <laughs> so, you know, they used him, and for all that, you know, he's making like $7,000 a year. <laughs> and you know something? I think what a hit, deal. I think he hit 435 once. I think his overall average was 235 for a pitcher that's It was. Right? Very good. Yeah. He holds the record for the, the single season record still. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually he was he was in the 200s almost, uh, and then for some reason in 1925 he's starting to come to the end of his career, and he hit 433, and that's still the record for uh, pitchers. And, and you know what the thing is, he was not an imposing kind of pitcher like Bob Gibson. Okay, now you remember Bob Gibson more than I do because I was born. In the oh country. man, they talk you, about him. You know, he wasn't, I mean... Or Lefty Grove, you know. They, yeah. Lefty Grove would, he would hit somebody in the back just as soon as talk to him. You know, it was just part of pitching. It was just, they regarded it as uh, Don Drysdale, you remember? Oh. He and he the- his reputation for going after hitters, you know, you get too close to that plate. and no, Well, Walter never did that. He was always afraid. They talked about that a lot, the guys that uh, played with him and against him. They said... He was always afraid. He talked about it. He was afraid that he could kill somebody with that fastball. So he was very careful, and he had great control. And the catchers all said the same thing. They said, you know, that, boy, wherever I put the glove, that's where the ball would end up. He had such wonderful control. So, interestingly, he did end up with a significant number of hit batsmen as a statistic in his career. But I suspect with those uh, baggy uniforms they wore back then, I, I suspect that, um, you know, a lot of those guys, it was either, you know, they they were either going to play baseball for a living or they, they were going to be working in the mines or working on a farm or something like that. So they would do anything to get on base, and I think a lot of them uh, would get hit, would kind of, you know, managed to get a sleeve brushed by one of Walter's pitchers or something. I think that's probably what most of that was about. But he you know, was very careful. He was careful, and you know some. But you know some, when you pitch as many innings, when you pitch as many complete games, which is which will never be broken, the 500 and something. Uh, yeah, amazing. So, I mean, that's a mind-boggling statistic today. Today, I think. No pitcher today will have, unless they start going back, to, and, and actually, you know, there, there's a manager or two these days that are letting their pitchers stretch out a little more uh, into the seventh and eighth innings and stuff as a strategy. But unless they go back to what it was when I was a kid, I mean, they'll never. He had 110 shutouts. No pitcher's ever going to have 110 complete games. No. From our era, from today's time, they just don't finish the games anymore. No, but I'll tell you, you made you made a you made a point. Walter Johnson was afraid he would kill someone with his fastball. And Ty Cobb. He did. He, he was a very gentle guy, yes. big, strong guy, but uh, very gentle and very kind. That was part of his uh, persona. And um, he, knew, uh, he knew that that baseball could be a weapon, and a lot of pitchers didn't hesitate to employ that weapon <laughs> almost like it's another pitch you know you got the your fastball and your curve and then you got the inside pitch you got that uh under the chin ball or whatever you'd call it and, and walter never did that they all the batters said the same thing about him they said as fast as he was you weren't afraid because you knew and he had that great control and you knew you knew the pitch was going to be over the plate but there wasn't it didn't help that knowledge didn't help. You still couldn't hit it. That's how fast he was. And, you know, Ty Cobb attests to that, but he also learned that was Johnson's weakness. And he made sure when he came up he was going to huddle as close as he could to the plate so that Walter, it would break Walter from not uh, beating him and he might mess up Walter's uh, delivery. That's a, a fascinating uh, episode and Cobb writes about it at great length in his uh, autobiography that he wrote with uh, Al Stump in the early 60s 
about how he discovered, you know, Cobb was always looking for an edge. Um, he was just uh, determined to win at almost any cost. And how um, he saw in, 19, now this is 1915, so Cobb had been facing Johnson for eight years at that point. And I traced, believe it or not, Ian, and, and Cobb's the only batter I did this with. Well, I might have done it with Faith. Babe Ruth. I traced every single appearance that uh, Cobb and uh, where Cobb and Johnson faced each other, and uh, documented that. And believe it or not, there was I think the total was 365. Ty Cobb got up against Walter Johnson 365 times in his career. That's almost two thirds of a season for a player just facing the one pitcher. But, of course, there were only eight teams back then, so the teams played each other 22 times a year. And uh, their their careers, uh, Cobb's career, completely enveloped Johnson's. Cobb started in 1905, finished in 1928, and Johnson pitched from 1907 to 1927. So even though Johnson pitched 21 seasons in the big leagues, every single one of those, Ty Cobb was in the league, too. So they faced each other a lot. Well, as Cobb wrote about it, one day in 1915, Cobb saw Johnson hit uh, Cobb's teammate, Ossie Vitt, with the Detroit Tigers in the head. And Vitt went down, and every, every everybody thought Vitt might be dead. They said he just dropped like a stone and didn't move. And he's laying there at the plate, and Walter comes in, and Walter's his face... Cobb said Walter's face turned white as a sheet, and he's just standing there looking. He thinks he, maybe he's just killed this guy. And Cobb, I guess, was the on-deck hitter, and he's standing there watching this scene, or he's watching from the dugout. And he, he, he thought to himself, wow, boy, that really bothered Johnson that he – oh, well, Vitt, Vitt got up uh, to, you know, to – Vitt wasn't killed. He got up after a while and actually staggered to first base. Those guys never came out of a game back then. And uh, he probably had a terrible concussion, and he still went on to first base. And so they, you know, that was that was okay. But Johnson was so shook up that all of a sudden, he and he had been pitching a terrific game. It's like the fourth inning or something. He'd been pitching a good game. And now he can't even he can't get the ball over the plate. They're getting hits off of him. Uh, he's being careful about where you know he's not to throw inside. And, and Cobb just thought that was fascinating to see how shook up Johnson was at the at the fact that he might have really hurt this this ball player. So leave it to Cobb. So Cobb thought, aha. And Cobb, the previous eight years against Johnson, I think his batting average was two twenty. And he couldn't, no power, he just couldn't do anything with Johnson. And Johnson wrote later about how he loved to pitch to Cobb and how he always turned it up a notch. Of course, Cobb was the great hitter in the league. And, you know, what a great match. He got the great, the best pitcher and the best hitter. And, and Walter said he loved to strike out Cobb. And imagine how angry that would make Cobb and stuff. So Cobb's thinking to himself, Boy, maybe I can use that. So he came up with the strategy, and only Ty Cobb would do this, actually do it, to crowd up to the plate. And he said, I would get up there so close that my toes were practically touching the plate. And then I'd lean over the plate and try to cover as much of the the plate territory as I could with my body. And he said, and I knew that Johnson, having seen him, be so careful after Ossie Vitt got hit. He said, "He said I knew that the pitch would be that he Johnson would be careful about throwing inside because he'd be afraid to hit me." And I'm telling you, Ian, as 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 I sit here after that, those years from 1915, that happened in 1915 to 1927 to the end of Walter's career, Cobb owned Walter Johnson. And I think he his batting average during that time was something like 435, 
And so what Cobb wrote in his autobiography about figuring out how to bat against Johnson. And so now he he knew that the pitch would be on the outside corner. It would still be a strike, he said, most of the time, because Walter had that great control. But he knew where the pitch would be and that he wouldn't throw inside. And I thought, when I read that in Cobb's autobiography, I thought, no, that doesn't – Walter wasn't stupid. He'd know that Cobb was – taken advantage of him and you know it just sounded too simplistic and you know a kind of a story that somebody would tell that well I, I traced it every at bat and it was absolutely true there's before that incident and after that incident and it's it's night and day and uh, Cobb figured it out uh, like he did uh, I guess so uh, you know with so many pitchers and circumstances uh, how to win, how to beat Walter Johnson and um, absolutely true and and also, also, Walter was such a good guy he was you know, afraid he, that he'd kill somebody and you know some when you think about it if he hit 220 uh, like you researched, if he hit 220 before 1915 and 435 after, you you, you put that together that comes out to uh, I don't know, 6 50, divide that by two against Walter Jones, you're still coming out with a 327 average. But Cobb hit 367, still well yes. below, still below 40 points in facing uh, uh, Walter Johnson. Now, and that's exactly right. I think his lifetime average, Cobb's lifetime average, was almost uh, precisely as you say. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think it was maybe 330 or 335, which is you know, that would be great for anybody else, but Cobb's lifetime batting average was 367 Yeah, <laughs> against and, and everybody. You, but you know some Ty Cobb, and, and I don't know, did you read uh, the new book by Charles Learson, Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty? No, I do, I do want to read it. That's getting a lot of uh, commentary these days. I do want to read that. It is definitely something you have to read because what he does is a lot of the stuff that Al Stump wrote and of course he wrote uh, another biography of Ty Cobb the year before you published your book Walter Johnson yeah. 1994 they made the movie uh, yeah. yeah which which is a terrible film I mean I mean I, I love it's awful it's uh, embarrassing I mean, I to watch terrible I love what's yeah. his name Tommy Lee Jones but the He's whole great. movie is, he, the, the, the whole movie is just a wreckage. Ty Cobb is nothing like that. And, in fact, no. him, and, him and Walter Johnson were actually friends. And I know for a fact, because I think you wrote about it in your book, that when they were inducted to, to the Hall of Fame, they both rode back on the train together. Oh, they were they were good friends. Oh, absolutely. Oh, they were good friends. Um of course, Walter loved everybody, but no, he he and Cobb uh, got along off the field famously, and there was never any, uh, you know, contretemps between them on the field either. Uh, and of course, they had, I mean, you know, they were the two at the top of certainly before Babe Ruth came along. I mean, they, you know, they occupied a place at the top of the American League, and it was just, you know, they were in a stratosphere of their own. So they got along. Yeah, I'd like to read that book. Look, I mean, I read enough in my research, my original research, to know that Ty Cobb was no saint. Uh, he loved to win. He had a terrible temper. Um, you know, he wasn't. He was. He just wasn't going to come down in history like a, a Walter Johnson or a Lou Gehrig or a Tris Speaker where everybody only had good things to say about him. That was not going to happen with Ty Cobb. But, on the other hand, he wasn't, uh, you know, the one-sided portrait uh, that uh, Stump painted and um, that has been, you know, largely disproven. Uh, that wasn't true either. So I understand this new book is kind of a balancing act. Uh, Cobb had a very good side. He was a very generous man. He did a lot of things to help people, and uh, he just wasn't the ogre off the field. Well, you know what? I mean, the, on the on the Glory of Their Times audio set, which I produced, I co-produced and edited. 
you can hear uh, most of the ball players. Yeah, they talk about how boy, you know, he was he was all about Ty Cobb and and he wanted to win and all like that. Uh, but uh, there's two, there's a couple things that stand out, and one is uh, almost to a man. They say he never spiked anybody. You know this whole oh, thing about Cobb. Cobb ripping people uh, to shreds. Uh, they say um, he, if you were standing in the way of the base, he would take you out. That's the way they put it. And, of course, you're sliding back then. Nobody slid head first. You're sliding with your spikes first. And you could get cut. They said that, you know. But, um, you know, the base, you know, the base belongs to the runner, <laughs> You know, you can't, you, you can't, so they said, these old ball players, they said, that's just good baseball. They said, you know, you, you have to get in there. It's your job. Uh, and if, uh, if uh, uh, you know, if the um, third baseman or the second baseman is standing in the way or the catcher, you got to get them out. you got to get them out. you got to take them out. And they said, that's what Cobb did, and he was good at it. He was damn good at it. And uh, but they they didn't hold it against him, and uh, several of them made it a point to say he never cut anybody on purpose. He wouldn't do that. He's just trying to get into that base. And the other thing they said was that off the field, he was a different person. <laughs> uh, but boy, on that field, um, he just had one thing in mind, just one, and that was to win. And you know, I mean, you can carry that. Winning, you know, despite what uh, Vince Lombardi said, you know, wins, winning's not everything in life, but you're there to win. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's time, uh, and uh, hopefully this book, this new book, uh, uh, I'll be in, very interested to read it, is the balancing uh, that uh, is due uh, about, uh, you know, the Ty Cobb story. And, you know, right now, I, you see, since we spoke, I've done a lot of research on the dead ball era, especially on Johnson. And I'm coming up with, because uh, I'm, I'm writing a book right now, and you mentioned it in your book briefly, the whole Ty Cobb, Tris Speaker, the Dutch Leonard affair. You know what I'm saying? That whole mm-hmm. thing that came out. Because there was never a book written about it, and no one knows about it. But this is what I want to say. In my research, and I wanted to ask you about it, because, uh, you know, we know that Walter Johnson was a nice guy. We know that he was honest. We know he used white balls. He didn't spit on it. He didn't. But Sam Crawford, I came across. Sam Crawford said, "Look, gambling pot, you know, pots of money would be collected by the end of the season for teams that were out of it. That would like ease up against those who would be in a pennant race." Sam Crawford and Walter Johnson were friends, and so what he said was, even Walter Johnson would let up at the end of the season because it was custom. I said, "Well, this is something I got to ask Hank Thomas about." What's your view on that? Um, well, uh, I've, I've um, in the glory of their times, I mean, Crawford talks about that uh, to Larry Ritter, and he, he says that uh, Walter, and he's not the only one, um, Jimmy Austin writes a story, too. If, if, if the game, and, and I've read that on a number of occasions, um, uh, Walter was a very friendly guy, and, uh, oh, and Walter's catchers wrote about it, too. And uh, let's say the game is... Um, you know, Walt, uh, Washington has the game well in hand. You know, it's like eight to two or something, and it's the eighth or ninth inning. And they said the catcher would, uh, and maybe Crawford uh, uh, used these words, but the catcher would say to the batter, "Hey, Sam, Walter likes you today," <laughs> and that would be the signal <laughs> that he was going to put one in. Mid speed over the plate, you know. Go ahead, go ahead and get yourself a, another triple or, you know, a double or whatever, um, you know, on me. Here, here's one, here's one on me. But they also said they were quick to add. And they said, boy, when the game was tight, and it didn't matter who was up, and uh, there were men on base, and now the game's on the line. They said. Oh boy! They said uh, Walter would step off the rubber, 
and he'd reach down and he'd grab uh, a little dirt in his pitching hand and let the dirt run through his fingers and then he'd he'd wipe his hands together <clears throat> and uh and then maybe hitch up his belt you know he had this little routine and he said oh man when you saw Walter when you saw Walter go through that he said you know he now you're getting the extra stuff. You're you're about to get the really the grade A fastball coming in. They said, "Uh oh, uh oh, here it comes." And uh, you know there was no friendliness then because Walter liked to win as much as uh, anybody else. And uh, but they they did say, uh, and you can hear it again on the Glory of the Times audio version where they talk about it. Jimmy Austin talks about it, and he said. He said one time, uh, said Walter's catcher said to him, uh, uh, Jimmy, Walter likes you today. And he said, he said, I hit it over the fence. And he said, I was uh, going around, around the bases. I don't know who was laughing harder, me or Walter. <laughs> so Walter would give him a gift. Uh, and they yeah. also said uh, he was nice to rookies, you know, if it didn't make a difference in the game. And there's a rookie up there. And, you know, those guys had a hard time breaking in. Um, and, uh, you know, he felt a little, most of them didn't make it, of course, and they'd just be up there for a cup of coffee. Walter tried to help him out. He'd, he'd lay one in there, you know, try to get a hit. If the game wasn't on the line, you know, if it didn't make any difference, it wasn't going to make any difference to the score. Uh, so, yeah, I love those stories. I mean, Walter yeah. was a, you know, he, he was a, he was a nice guy. He really was, genuinely. Everyone said that. And, and you know some, I um, I'm very fortunate because I'm sure you listen to the unedited uh, tapes of uh, Larry Ridden's um, The Glory of the Yeah, Day. many times I worked on them. Yeah. Yeah. So I just received from Notre Dame, and uh, I think the um, I should, I should, no, the uh, Cleveland uh, Public Library sent me uh, Ridden's off the. Um, off the uh, cuffed uh, tapes, as well as the transcript of smoke. Raw tapes. tapes. Yeah, yeah. Fabulous. Uh, they, wow. Yeah. yeah, and I got it on my. Uh, they send it digital. It's all been digitalized, and also his 1974 interview. When I forget the guy's name, it, it eclipses me. But both of them were sent to me, and he he even says, "Look, Walter, and you write it in your book." So that's another thing I remembered. Walter Johnson was just aghast the way that Smokey Joe Wood would throw a ball. He's like, how the hell does he throw that way? He's going to hurt himself. And he did. Yeah, he said it. Walter said it made, you know, it it made me hurt to watch the way he wrenched his shoulder. Ian, let me throw in something. You just got those tapes, and there's a really interesting story about do you know about the duplicate Joe Wood tape? Uh, well, I, the only do you know that story. Well, I think what happened was, uh, if, if you, you could correct me, is that he kept talking too long, Smokey Joe, and what happened was he asked Ritter not to publish the stuff, and, and Ritter never did. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, Ritter sort of never did. Yeah. Right. Um, and. Uh, it, it ties into you were talking about that gambling scam. It does, and he 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 admits that Cobb and Speaker Leonard and himself put the bet where when they were before Landis's Inquisition back in early, late 1926, early 1927, it proved 40 years later that they all lied. That's yeah, it. and he lays it out, and I think that's the main reason. There's some other, but here's what happens. So. I had seen the video. There we are, me and my partner Neil McCabe, who did the um, the beautiful uh, Charles Conlon uh, photo book of baseball, the Golden Age of Baseball, the photographs of Charles M. Conlon. That's a whole other story. I mean, Neil really kind of started, pioneered the whole interest in baseball photography. That's now at a fever pitch, and there's. There's individual photos going on the collector's market for thousands of dollars. And before then, you'd see a stack of photos. I'd go to a memorabilia show, and there'd be a stack of photos 
and a, and a sign that said a dollar each, and they didn't care if it was a, a Conlon photo or a Paul Thompson or if it was a Babe Ruth or Walter Johnson. They did just a stack of them. And um, anyway, uh, Neil uh, decided that Charles Conlon was actually, he calls him uh, the Richard Avedon of baseball photographers and did a book about it. So anyway, so Neil, Neil and I, it's another long story I won't go into, but Neil and I, Larry Ritter, uh, agreed to allow us to make an audio version of his classic book, The Glory of Their Times. And uh, we knew they had been taped. He had tape recorded all these. So he, uh, he had donated those tapes originally to the Hall of Fame and then he had made a, a, um, he had sent another set to the, to Notre Dame, to their, um, uh, uh, sports archive there. So, Bud Greenspan, the famous Olympic documentarian, had made a video called The Glory of Their Times, which is wonderful. Have you seen that, Ian? I have, and I have to go look at it. Okay, you can find it on YouTube, <clears throat> the whole thing. It only runs for an hour, I think. And it played on, uh, that was 1970, and it played on PBS uh, a few times, and I guess then disappeared. It came out on VHS tape in um, the 80s. I, I, you know what? I think it just came out on CD, if I'm not mistaken, just a few months ago. But you can find it on YouTube. So uh, in that uh, video version of The Glory of Their Times, Bud Greenspan, he's got old film and photos. And over that, and a narrator, it's narrated by Alexander Scorby, who was the voice of God of narrators, just a wonderful piece of work uh, itself, and and uh, he used snippets of the of Ritter's tapes, uh, the voices of the ball players telling these stories, and Joe Wood had told a story about uh, Walter Johnson on there. So I'm listening now. I'm working on the audio version of uh, the Glory of Their Times, and I'm listening to the Joe Wood uh, interview, and I get to the end of it, and I'm like. Wait a minute. Where? How? Uh, what happened? Where's that story that I heard on on uh, the the Greenspan documentary? It's not here. I'm like, so I called Larry and I said, Hey, uh, Larry, you know, there's that uh, story that Joe Wood told about Walter Johnson that Greenspan used, and I, I it's not on the tape. Um, you know, uh, it's missing. How come it's missing? And Ritter says, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot, oh, gosh, I forgot to tell you guys about that. So, yeah, Joe, Joe, after we did our interview, Joe uh, Wood called me up and, and he said, you know what, Larry, um, some of those things I said on there, um, I, I really, uh, I, yeah, gosh, you know, I, I shouldn't have said those things. And he was talking about, uh, he, had, he had said it some uncomplimentary things about Babe Ruth, and he had laid out this gambling story <laughs> where him and Tris Speaker and Ty Cobb had bet on a baseball game and all like that. So Ritter, of course, goes, um, so Joe Wood says, uh, I, I really appreciate if you destroy that tape, and let's do another interview. And Ritter, you know, what can he say? You know, He says, oh, okay, gosh, uh, uh, you know, we'll do another interview, and he did. He went back, and they did another interview. And as far as Joe Wood knew, okay, that's that's that. That takes care of that. Well, as Larry told me, he, he said, he said, I really didn't destroy that first interview, and he said I I didn't send a copy of it to uh, the Hall of Fame when I do donated all the originals because I thought Joe Wood might might hear it there. But I did send one to Notre Dame, to their archive. So, so call the guy at Notre Dame and ask him um, to uh, to send you the uh, original interview with Joe Wood. So I did, and I got it, and uh, I heard it, and I heard the Walter Johnson story, and oh my gosh, on there, as you know, is the I mean he just lays out that gambling story in complete detail and we ended up putting it on our um set the audio set i mean it's fascinating 
And between the two interviews, so we had to do a lot of editing on that, but between the to, – to make it make sense, because a lot of it doesn't – he's kind of going back and forth between the Black Sox scandal, which they weren't involved in. But it involves the White Sox to some extent because they, as he tells it, they were – the White Sox didn't dare, the way he puts it, win the pennant in 1920 because – the invested by the time of the 1920, the end of the pennant race, and now we're coming up to the World Series, there were starting to be articles about the 1919 World Series. I don't know why it took a year. I guess some of the ball players were, maybe they didn't, they didn't get the, all the money they were due or something. So they started talking to the reporters. So that story started to break toward the end of the 1920 season. And the White Sox, Told he said the White Sox players told Joe Wood that we don't dare win the pennant this year because if we get into the World Series, this whole story about what happened in 1919 is just going to blow wide open. Uh, and so, so uh, there was a series. I guess Detroit was playing the White Sox, and so Ty Cobb and Joe Wood and Tris Speaker they knew the White Sox were going to try to lose these games. This is, this is at the tail end of the 1920 season, not 1919. So they bet on it. And, of course, Cobb defends it and Joe Wood defends it. And he says, now, we were betting on ourselves. We weren't betting, you know, for our team to lose. He tries to defend the fact that he was he and these other guys were betting on. Uh, and that scandal popped in 1926. And that's why... Um, uh, Cobb and Speaker were still playing, and Landis made them change teams. I don't know, you know, that doesn't seem like much punishment, but Landis basically squashed it, and, you know, he didn't want a scandal at that point. This is something that had happened six years earlier, and these guys are coming to the end of their careers anyway. But isn't that a fascinating, that's just a, what an interesting event and it almost it almost blew my mind. I mean, I got in fact I yeah. got the letters of Ritter right in front of me, the unedited uh, things. And you know, it seems. And I spoke to Gerald Wood, and I don't know if you know who Gerald Wood. He wrote the biography of uh, Smokey Joe Wood, and um, he's going to be writing my piece uh, of uh, Smokey Joe's involvement in the Speaker Cobb affair. And it uh-huh. seems, uh, it seems now if you go back, it was in 1919. The game was played on September 25th, 1919. Uh, Cleveland and Detroit uh, were playing each other. The White Sox was clinched. Uh, Cleveland uh, were already clinched second. And now back then what people don't know is third place used to get some money. And Detroit was, uh, uh, you know, in a battle against the Yankees for third place, which would mean 500 bucks for each play, and that goes a long way back then to the penny wages they had. And what happened was they all met under a, uh, a sort of story goes, they all met under the, the grandstands, and uh, everybody wanted to get in it, and Cobb wanted to get in it, and Speaker got into it. But Wood took the fall from because when, when this came up, Wood was at Yale. Okay, and he was out of baseball. Mm-hmm. And uh, Fred West, who uh, right. Fred yeah. West, who was he went. He had bookies in Chicago. Now he now what happened? The original story was they couldn't place the bet because the bookies were too uh, scared to place as much money as Cobb and uh, Speaker and all these other guys were going to put in Ritter's tapes. Wood admits that he took the fall for them. But he was only the banker, that he didn't really bet on the games. He just gave it to Joe West to go place the bets. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, he does say that, doesn't he? He says, I was just the middleman or yeah. something like that. But there's other times where he says, yeah, I, yeah, I bet on baseball, but I didn't he bet did. you know, against my team. Now, now, you say the game was in 1919. I, it was. I, it was. I always yeah. thought it was. He he talks about twenty. He says that game in yes. twenty. He does talk about twenty, and that was a. So is he that, confused about the year? Um, I it, it would appear so because I have right Or maybe there was two different games that they bet on. We don't. Know. I wonder if we that's don't. possible. 
We don't he know. talks about, you know, the, the way he lays it out, he says, yeah, the, you know, the White Sox players, they said, we don't dare win the series this year. So he couldn't have been talking about 19. I mean, no, they, they was, had already won the series. So. Right. And or they had won the pennant. So. Right. They, they, they yeah. did. That. Now, that goes back to 1917. That you see now, while the whole Cobb speaker thing is playing out, because Van Johnson, and we'll have to get to it next time because we got to run. But anyway, Van Johnson mm-hmm. got got a hold of this from Dutch Leonard. He didn't tell Landis about this whole thing. He kept it under wraps for about four or five months, and then in September, after the twenty sixth season, he said to Cobb and Speaker, "These are the letters I received: one from Wood, uh, one from Cobb, and showed him. You know, Leonard brought. He's like." Uh, you guys are going to be suspended from baseball. Go on your hunting trip or whatever to the to the west, and when you come out, you, you're going to resign. And all of a sudden, within yeah. three weeks of each other, they resign. And now all of baseball is like, well, what the hell's going on? And so, yeah, Johnson uh, was going to make a, you know, I don't know why it just doesn't make, you know, he was the president of the American League, but he he was going to make a huge scandal out of it. And Landis is like, you know, no, 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 we can't have another one. But uh yeah. yeah. Now has there has there ever been is your book about the scandal? My whole book is, is that about what you're the writing scandal? about? I'm writing right now about three hundred pages. Well it's fantastic. I mean it needs a book. It's such an yeah. interesting yeah. and it ties into the whole nineteen nineteen thing. That's well, such an interesting incident. Well, and to happened. try to make sense of it, you know, we tried to make sense me and Neil, you know, from what we had on the tapes and um uh, do you have that audio set, The Glory of Their Times? I don't have it, but I, I don't have it. I can always go to my library and listen to it, but that's the end. Uh, or you can download it. You can you yeah. can uh, get on audible.com and download right. it. But you ought to listen to what we put together because we did the best we could to try, <laughs> try to, and it took a lot of editing because we had the two different tapes. But uh, we tried to piece it together to where Joe's Joe Wood's story made sense, and it wasn't easy. But we we ended up thinking, well, this game was in 1920, 19, not 1919, that they that they bet on. But you know, heck, maybe there was more than. But I I, I will be fascinated to read a thorough and well researched account of that of that scandal. Yeah, and you know, and you. It is, and I'm planning to publish it early next year. You know, and you're probably familiar with it, um, there was only two books written on Landis, but one of them was Judge Landis in 25 Years of Baseball by J., uh, John George Taylor Spink. And mm-hmm. He had firsthand knowledge of what went on. He was one of the few writers who actually knew what was going on. Does he lay it out in that book? He lays it out back in 1947 when this book was published, which I'm holding in my hot little hands right now from the library, which I've downloaded on the Kindle as well, and which I'm mm-hmm. taking a lot of it because it's a primary source. Okay? Mm-hmm. I, you know, and plus I'm using um, Charles Learson's book. I'm using... Um, Tris Speaker, A Rough and Tumble Life, which was published oh, about 11 years ago. And then I'm using well, Cobb the- must have written something about it, because I remember on the tapes, Ritter says to Joe Wood, he says, well, you know, Cobb wrote about it in his book, and, uh, you know, he, he uh, how does he put it, he says, um, he didn't hesitate to talk about it, something like that, uh, he Larry Ritter but- said, said to Joe Wood. He didn't, but what he did was Cobb, and I'll finish the show like this. And then Wood Wood answers Ritter, and he says, yeah, but he didn't tell the whole story. (laughs) He didn't, but what he did was he said, look, I didn't bet on it. I was the intermediary who hooked him up with Fred West, which was a total lie, because, you know, Uh you guys – which was, but you know, some when Ben Johnson found, uh, he sent the the Pinkerton uh, detectives to follow Speaker and Wood, uh, excuse me, Speaker and Cobb. And what they found out, look, Cobb didn't usually bet, but Speaker bet on everything, horses, uh, dice, everything. And, uh, you know, Speaker's not even mentioned in either one of these letters. Only a third-party Cleveland Indian player who would refuse to answer to Landis when he was grilled on uh, Landis. He's like, look, he's not part of baseball anymore. And, and Landis just left uh-huh. him. He, he didn't even... <laughs> He uh, didn't even proceed. And, you know, I got all of those uh, things, which I'm publishing in the book, the whole inquisition of that. And while that was going on, Sweet Reisberg and Chuck Gandel comes back saying, yeah, this is nothing compared to what. And then he had to stop the cop speaker 
uh, thing, and then go uh-huh. back to 1917 and get the whole, you know, Tiger and White Sox together because of that scandal that happened then, where everyone was just collecting pots, and I think 35 yeah. players, including Cobb, and Cobb was pissed off at Landis that he had to testify in another case when he was pissed off that Landis told people. It's a great story. We'll get together on it. I'm going to end the show. I like came this across. Time. I came across, I think it was 1912, where, and I think I have this in a footnote in my book, where just a note in the Washington Post where uh, the reporter ran into, I think it was it was uh, maybe uh, Walter Johnson, Clyde Milan, and Nick Altrock walking out of one of the games of the World Series that year. Actually, maybe it was 19. I don't know, it was the A's, so they were in, anyway, it was one of those uh, World Series in 1911 or 13 or 14 that the A's were in, and they were walking out of the the uh, Philadelphia ballpark of the World Series game, and a reporter ran into them, and he said uh, they all looked so happy, and they were, they were happy because they, they had all made, uh, they had, they had uh, bet on uh, the game, and they had won, and they had won a considerable amount of money or something. And here, you know, betting – now, I mean, they weren't playing in the game. They had just they had just gambled on who was going to win the game. So no big deal, but, you know, that would certainly be frowned on uh, – you know, that's what Pete Rose says he did. He just bet on games that he wasn't involved in. There's some question about that. But the whole history of gambling – and baseball had gone way back, <laughs> and uh, you know that that would be fascinating to tie, you know, that scandal and and uh, the the Joe Wood scandal, and then 1919, as you said, 1917, and then it yeah. goes back even, you know, you know, Gandal had been doing stuff for years, Hal Chase had been doing stuff for years, um, Reed Reisberg, I mean, they all yeah, work. They're ball players, you know, suspicious stuff, but nothing. You know, it took them fix, trying to fix the World Series for it all to kind of explode, and uh, for to bring in somebody like Landis with his reputation and clean up the game. I mean, you can't. You know, people. But, as soon as people start thinking the games aren't on the up and up, you know, your sport's done. Nobody's going to want to go. And you know, so I'm going to end it like this because what I found and what I put in here, I found many articles from the Marquette Law uh, Institute. Uh, uh, Marquette Law School, and I literally put all the major cases that Landis did prior to becoming Commissioner of Baseball, including, which we'll talk about next time, the Federal League, which I know Johnson, uh, Walter Johnson was very sympathetic, and he refused the offer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he remained faithful to uh, Clark Griffith and the. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, that's a quite a story in and of itself. Uh, We'll get to that, but what happened and why Pete Rose was thrown out the way he did, because after Swede Reisberg, uh, that whole Reisberg and Gandal uh, thing, uh, where he ruled, look, nothing really happened, uh, these guys are in Buck Weaver pleaded with uh, Landis, and this is, you know, six years after he got thrown out, he asked right on the stand during these uh, – uh, you know, proceedings in early 1927, can I be reinstated, uh, you know, uh, to baseball? Baseball, uh, I don't owe anything ba- to baseball. Baseball owes me something. Because all he did was, was be aware in the room. He never put a bet down. But Landis did a sweep with a net and said, anyone who knew about this, anyone who took money from it, doesn't matter. You knew about it and didn't say anything, you're barred for life. And he had to make yeah. a point. He had to make mm-hmm. a point. Now, the reason why Rose got it was because four precedents were set down right before he ruled on Cobb and Speaker. And numbers three and four were the very fine line. If you bet on baseball and you don't play in that game, you're going to be suspended for a year. However, if you're betting on a game where you're involved in, well, that's going to involve fraud. And that's where you're going to take a lifetime ban. Sure, where you can influence what goes on in the game. Right. And that's yeah. the fine line. And, and I, mm-hmm. I go into a lot of it. I'll be publishing it next year. You've got to get me the, the, um, 
we'll talk. Uh, maybe I'll just send you an instant message. We'll talk about it. Um, hang on the line for the last minute. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some stuff uh, for what's going to happen next time, and we'll be in touch. Uh, hang on for a second, Hank. Folks, I really enjoyed sure. having Hank Thomas on the show. It's always, it's always a pleasure. When you get the big train's grandson and you just open up the knowledge and then and, and surely Hank knows about the dead ball era. You know, we spoke about the glory of their times. I didn't get to what I wanted to talk to uh, totally with Hank, but we'll have him on the show in the fall. Maybe one or two shows. Go out, get his book, Walter Johnson, Baseball's Big Train. Believe me, folks, you won't be disappointed. As always, I am Ian Kahanowitz on behalf of... Hank Thomas and, of course, Ralph Tycho and the whole Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And in the immortal words of Edward R. Murrow, good night, folks. Good luck. We'll see you next time.